Well, we hope to be back together soon. We are currently planning that we'll be back here in church with some new requirements and being very careful um, two weeks from this Sunday on um, the first Sunday in June. And there'll be more information about that coming out soon. But l- let me get to where we're at today. I want to talk to you a little bit from Acts chapter 1 because Easter is kind of drawing to a close. And, and I want to look at a passage and talk a little bit about that idea uh, this morning. It, we're going to look at Acts chapter 1, beginning with verse 6 and going through verse 14. And it goes like this. Luke tells us, when they met together, they asked him, Lord, are you at this time going to restore the kingdom of Israel? He said to them, it is not for you to know the times or dates the Father has set by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. After he had said this, he was taken up before their very eyes, and a cloud hid him from their sight. They were looking intently up into the sky as he was going, when suddenly two men dressed in white stood beside them. Men of Galilee, they said, why do you stand here looking into the sky? This same Jesus who has been taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen him go into heaven. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the hill called the Mount of Olives, a Sabbath day's walk from the city. When they arrived, they went upstairs to the room where they were staying. Those present were Peter, John, James, and Andrew, Philip, and Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, James, son of Alphaeus, and Simon, the zealot, and Judas, son of James. They all joined together constantly in prayer, along with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and with his brothers. You know, how does Easter come to a close? And, and that's kind of, this passage is a good choice for that. It, this is our end point of Easter tide. It is the seventh and final Sunday in that season. And the disciples at this point in this passage in, in Acts chapter 1, they were in kind of a big finale mood also. And, and they're asking the questions, is, is it now? Is it time? is it that time, Jesus, when we make the world right, when we put down the Roman Empire, when we bring Israel back to power? It's like, Jesus, let's go. Is it now? Can we get it all done? And sometimes you don't get the answer you want, or sometimes you don't get any answer. And here they don't get answers. Instead, they get a job, work to do, and the promise of spiritual resources for the work. And they, and of course later us, in this we find a purpose for our lives. And Jesus rises up into the sky until the clouds block any further view. And they watch him like a crowd watching an escape balloon just float away into the distance to see how long they can track it. And then it's like they're staring to see if it's going to come back into view. Of course, they get a nudge from a couple of angels to ask them how long they plan on doing that. Um, I guess there's an issue of focus there. Is the mission to stare up into the sky and wait, or is it to go in the power of the Holy Spirit and be witnesses? The Greek word for witness is the word martyr, from where we get our English word martyr. Of course, we use that in English to mean someone who dies for the cause. In Greek, It didn't expect you necessarily to die for being a witness, though they were willing to. You just had to be someone who gave witness, gave testimony to the message and the work of Jesus. So they go back to Jerusalem, which admittedly is not that far away. It's basically the next hill, or as it says, a Sabbath day's journey, or about two-thirds of a mile. Because if you walked more than that on the Sabbath day, it would be considered working on the Sabbath. So it wasn't that far that they had to go. But when they got there, they waited and they prayed. And waiting waiting and praying, that's not that easy for us most of the time. We are a moving, high-speed, online bunch of modern people who are used to instant everything. 
You know, I stayed in a hotel for three nights this week, and you should have seen me with the pancake machine at the hotel this week. I thought I was obsessed with the waffle machine at hotels. This thing, you push a button, and about a minute later, two fresh-made pancakes come rolling out the end of the machine. I ate some serious pancakes this week. I even took pictures of the machine. You know, that's us. We like it fast. We're impressed with that. But they had to wait, and they had to pray. And I think that's where we've been stuck lately. We're waiting. We're praying. We're wondering. And maybe we need to realize that sometimes waiting and praying is not a bad thing. The movement of the Spirit of God is not automatic. And sometimes we need to wait, and sometimes we need to pray. And I think, or at least I hope, that spiritually we want to make sure that our shut-in times have not been wasted. And I think that many of us have been reading our Bibles more, and we've been talking to God more. We've been learning and growing more. We are using the times we have been given to grow and to learn and to get something out of it. There's a short exchange that was written by J.R.R. Tolkien in The Lord of the Rings. And, And I really love seeing it in the movie, but it's in the book too. And in this exchange, Frodo, the little hobbit, says to the wizard Gandalf about the situation they're in, I wish it need not have happened in my time. And Gandalf replies, so do I. And so do all who live to see such times, but that is not for them to decide. All we have to decide is what to do with the time that is given us. And that sums up the past few months. We would not have chosen this, but we don't get that choice. We do get to choose what we do with this time that we have been given. That's the only choice we have. And... The disciples gathered and prayed, waiting for the power, for the mission that they had already been given. And that part comes next Sunday. We'll talk about that a little bit, that power part next week. But the mission, Jesus didn't come saying that the church is at hand. He said the kingdom of God is at hand. And they understood kingdoms. Rome had the biggest empire the world had ever seen, led by Caesar, self-proclaimed Lord of all. And they expected a kingdom to triumph over Rome. And they really expected that would be the kingdom of Israel. But that's not the kingdom Jesus talked about. He kept referring to the kingdom of God. And it's the kingdom that he wanted them to understand. It's here, but there's still a part of it that's still yet to come. And this kingdom would not meet their goals because their goals really were driving out Rome, turning the power upside down, overthrowing the rich and the powerful. That's not the kingdom they got. They got a different kingdom, one where the will of God would be done, in Jesus' words, on earth as it is in heaven. They just weren't used to a kingdom based in love instead of in power. Jesus, the king was the one who washed people's feet. So you get love and mercy and servanthood instead of wealth and power. That's his kingdom. If we are honest, we have seen repeated examples of crooked governments being ousted only to find that the next government comes in behind them and they're just as crooked as the one before. It's like we got those crooks out and now it's our turn to be the pigs at the trough and get all we can get. And we get it now instead of them. Jesus did not come to let a different group rise up to the wealth and the power. He came to bring a different model, a growing group of people who would be citizens of his kingdom, who lived out their citizenship as servants in the name of love. So many long for the wealth and the power and the fame and the privilege to, as so many would say, get to the top. And the disciples are right there wrestling with those temptations. Is it now? Is it our turn? Are we going to do it now, Jesus? You know, the question is what does it take to let go of dreams of wealth and power or position, of making it to the top, 
to find this radical dream of serving instead those at the bottom. Jesus said, when you do it to the least of these, you do it to me. So when you serve at the bottom, to the ones who are the most broken and the most hurting and the most left out and the most undesirable, that's where Jesus is, right there. That's where you'll find him. And why do they have to wait? Why do they have to pray? Because you can't do this. You can't be like that. You can't have your desires redefined like that without the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit because something has to change. And so they have to wait and they have to pray and they have to seek and they have to look. Let's make sure that our time of waiting is not wasted. Let it renew us, prepare us, let it change us. As we have been checking on each other and helping each other and praying for each other, finding creative ways to encourage each other, that's when we've been living out the mission. Day by day and week by week, man, everything around us is changing. And we are just figuring it out as best we can. But let's make sure we are seeking to let God change us for the better along the way. The mission is still love. The mission of a kingdom that has values that no other kingdom on earth has ever shared, where power, resources, effort all aim down toward the bottom instead of up toward the top, because that's the kingdom of Jesus. Can we pray together? God, let this be a time of renewal for all of us. Let it be a time of revival where your spirit works just in a fresh and new way within us to redefine our priorities once again, to remind us of the importance of servanthood and the fact that we can only serve with that focus and with that kind of a giving heart when you give us the heart. Let your spirit renew our hearts, deepen our love for people, and let us be excited, not just about getting back to some of the things we've been missing, but getting out to new opportunities to love and serve and be your martyrs, your witnesses, your people who testify to your presence and your grace and your love and what it has meant is meaning and is going to mean in our lives. Get us ready. Get us ready. And help us to be praying and looking and waiting for what you're going to do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. By way of leading into blessing, I want to use some verses pulled from 1 Peter 4. And here's what Peter says. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Know that your brothers and sisters in all the world are undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ will himself Restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. And to let that be our blessing, may you know the spiritual unity we have with our worldwide family in Jesus. All of us going through uncertain times, but finding ourselves by the God of all grace, restored, supported, strengthened, and established by his power that is without end.